years ago um, at one of the TED conferences, uh, I had so often been asked, you know, how do I end up doing what I'm doing that I did a bit of a kind of a biography and uh, Lakshmi asked if I would share some of that with you today. Because um, I have a bit of an unorthodox background. Well, we, were, we went to, uh, to America from Greece after the war and basically ended up in the mills, uh, working in the mills and the rivers in New England. And so when I was 19 years old, I was fascinated about the stories of Greece. And so I went back and I spent a year herding 2,000 goats in the Macedonian Albanian borders down to Mount Olympus and um, taught myself photography and wrote a book. Uh, but one of the things I was fascinated by in this magnificent village, uh, my father is actually from the north of Greece and my mother is actually from the base of Mount Olympus. And, and what we have in Greece is the Greeks, um, the first book I did when I was 19 with Princeton University Press, which still is actually in press and is a, um, uh, required reading in anthropology is a book on ancient funeral and exhumation ceremonies dating back to Homer because the, Gre uh, the Greeks don't actually celebrate uh, birth, we only celebrate death. We go and mourn the body every night for almost a year and then various times throughout the five years. The soul is transcending to heaven so the flesh is related to the soul. The more flesh on the body, the more sins the person committed during their lifetime the less flesh, the less sins. So I went and recorded this book, and then here is an exhumation, and after we exhume the bones of, the, of our relatives, we then wash them in wine and water, and then we bury them in an ossuary with a photograph on it and a box, and we can actually bury this so that our, our enemies can't get to it, or we leave it in this kind of temple next to the church. This is my grandmother who went and got the skull of my grandfather when she would often have uh, lunch with him. Um, it was a bit of a one-way conversation, but it was. <laughs> but she, she enjoyed it. Uh, I, after leaving Greece, I came back to America because I was uh, fortunately I was given the gift of speed. I was fast enough to be an Olympian. I ran the uh, 400 meters in 45.9, and I wasn't fast enough to run for America, but I could run for Greece. And unfortunately, it was during the time of the boycott. Uh, uh, against uh, Moscow in 1980. So uh, I didn't end up competing, but the reason I'm showing this photograph, this is my father who's actually shaving me in preparation for a triathlon. We're a very close family, as you can see. <laughs> but actually, my father has a very interesting story. He was the captain of the Marxist underground on Mount Olympus. And so when he came to America, you know, as a goat herder and a, and a uh, freedom fighter, he said there are no need for freedom fighters in New Hampshire. And uh, uh, I mean, there are no shepherds here either. So he said, I know how to shear sheep, so I'll shear women, and became a hairdresser. And though half the women who left this shop looked as though they should have been grazing, it was my, <laughs> it was, it was my first example that skill sets are transferable. <laughs> I, w I came back to the States to become an artist, and I studied under uh, Lucas Amaris and George Siegel for three years, but I was fascinated about trying to find something that resembled the bones and the drama of the history that I had left. And in the teaching files of hospitals, they had these magnificent, bizarre old x-rays. And the only way to get in there was to have some reason to be in the hospital. My brother, who is now chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at Brown University, uh, at that time was a resident. And I went in and actually started just doing a picture story that Life magazine liked. And I became fascinated by, you know, how the laser light was moving across and refracting across the, the eye. And I thought, oh, this is really, really cool stuff. Fortunately, life liked the story and then allowed me to be, you know, do stories for them and for other magazines for the next 15 years, including taking uh, pictures of my own surgery. But what really fascinated me over those many years is I started to, wanted to go to places where the light was going. And so I started to teach myself mathematics and advanced math and then physics. And um, I started designing my own cameras and lenses. So I designed here a contact hysteroscope that basically is taking an image of the photograph of the embryo outside the amniotic sac. The amniotic sac has like little windows and as you move your lens across every once in a while a little bit of the fetus will be there and my lens is touching right up against his fingers. So there's a new lens that I designed and it became a cover of many magazines. Then I designed a new microscope that could actually photograph eggs in the first in vitro fertilization program and we watched some of the kids that were being born from some of the technologies that we were actually perfecting. What was becoming really interesting is that um, 21 years ago, I actually started seeing some of the work that was coming in from CT scanners and MR scanners, and I thought, my God, that's, that's better than a camera because it's going places where the camera can't go. And I knew, I understood physics and I understood you know, math very well, and I thought, well, you know, okay, let's just ratchet up a little bit. You, then you have to learn Unix and then C and C++, and then basically I started writing algorithms and code to start trying to actually compile these images into, uh, into stories that we could actually look at and prepare surgeries in advance. And I started writing these algorithms in code where we were actually 
doing these surgeries on these, these kids, and here's a child with a craniofacial abnormality where basically I was writing code to prepare the surgery, because sometimes you would have to actually do these surgeries you know, four times, and it was devastating for the family. So here's this child who basically has sealed plates, and as you can see, uh, the eyeball, which I've sort of coated in uh, purple there, and you can see it here, um, that basically it's a little bit concave. And we were able to do the operation exactly as I planned in the virtual surgery in advance. And then we actually performed it perfectly. I mean, in the background is her brain, in the foreground is her skull, which they're cutting up. Put it back together again, pulled her face together. And basically, 18 hours later, she's back with her mother. And uh, a short time later, what we did is we basically looked at could we release her from the hospital, and we found that that was you know, she was you know, perfectly healthy. Uh, and we could actually release her, and here she was like two months later, and here she is four months later, perfectly healthy. So we realized these technologies really could be applied on a clinical level, they could be applied on a research level, but I also was fascinated on using it to sort of uh, a new type of art. So I scanned myself with a spiral CT set, and one of the things is I showed you a little bit earlier, that photograph on the box of the exhumation, I started to build, I thought this would be really interesting because wouldn't it be fascinating if all these new scans could have multiple uh, properties? One is that not only could we actually use it clinically uh, uh, to do surgery, but we could actually use it for research. But at the same time, why would it not be something that I could actually make art out of? So this is a kind of a, I'm, I'm making a box like, a, like in my family's graves, and I actually uh, exhumed myself. It's a little bit like the Woody Allen joke. I don't mind dying, I just don't want to be there when it happens. But, <laughs> but fundamentally, these pictures are images of, of myself sort of dating back, using data that can, one, be my patient record, two, be used for research, I mean, three, for clinical, and fundamentally, we can use this for any kind of purpose. And what we're finding is that, why does data have to be so limited? You have the ability to use it on so many levels that we then started to use this kind of information from an educational perspective as well in teaching about Alzheimer's or um, in this case here, again, it's uh, my skull for another cover of Life magazine. My mother knew it was me immediately from the nose. <laughs> but as you can see, the thing is that these are, this is a bit of a, a kind of an unorthodox path. You know, the, it's not the typical career path of a Macedonian goat herder to a multidimensional algorithmic programmer. But in essence, there are no uh, real paths. And one of the things that I wanted to bring attention to quickly was that the idea is that you are only limited by your imagination and the possibilities are infinite. And with a lot of the young kids, that's all we've been trying to share here. And I want to thank you. It's been a magnificent experience for me and I very much hope to come back uh, at any time that you guys invite me back. Thank you again.